So, so good to be with all of you here today. This wonderful, wonderful day. Wonderful day because we've got carols on. And Carol and I feel particularly blessed because you put this event on to celebrate our wedding anniversary and we can't thank you enough. So really, really appreciate all the effort you've gone to. So uh, Carol and I have uh, been together for married for 35 years. And I've got a photo for you of a little while back. Now, Carol hasn't changed much. I didn't put me in there because I was like, I changed heaps. Even this morning, our grandchildren looked at our wedding photo and said, Grandma, you look beautiful. Who is that man? <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, 31 years ago with our daughter Jade and, of course, our son Jordan, who now is 33. So it's around about that time. I'm not great with dates. Amazing time to have a child. Uh, we've been blessed with four children. Back then, in those days, this was before the earth had cooled, and so we didn't have Facebook. Today, when you guys have a baby or even think about having a baby, it's up on Facebook. Even when you get your first scan, like it's up on Facebook, and we get to see that baby. It's amazing. Back then, we had to ring up the local newspaper and give them the details. We have a baby that weighs 33 stone and is six foot long, and... All the, all the details, and then they would print it up, and then we would go out and buy like copious amounts of the local newspaper so that we could have the registration of our baby's birth, and we'd cut it out, and we've got one at home cut out, and it's gone all yellow now because it's 31, two years old, and it's amazing, but that pales in comparison to what you're going to see in God's Word today, as Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, as we continue our Christmas series, forecast the birth of this amazing child 700 years before he was born. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And that's what God does. God does amazing things. And he was, uh, wants to speak to us about this child today. As we come into the Christmas time, we're going to be smothered with thoughts about a child. Most of us are going to be completely frantic trying to get organized for Christmas. Has everybody got their Christmas shopping done? Has everybody got all their food organized? Has everybody got the grandkids? We've got six grandkids, get all them organized and all frantic and everything else. And it just seems to be a, a real rush to Christmas time. And then we, we talk about the baby in the manger and we think about this tiny little infant that is so vulnerable and so weak and still nursing on its mother's breast and how could that impact our lives well, Isaiah just rips the lid off that and shows us really who this baby is. And my prayer for you today is that you get a fresh wonder for how amazing this baby is and how much of an answer he is to the need, the greatest need of the human condition. He is that very answer. Come with me in your Bibles to chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 of the book of Isaiah. I'd like to take a moment just to go through the first five verses with you. And those verses, if you haven't got a Bible, look at the one in the pew in front of you and open up and come along with me. I'd like to show you a few things there and set the scene for what was happening to the nation of Israel. Now, what's amazing about the way that God writes his word is God will be commenting on a historical event that's happening at the time. God will be speaking to the nation of Israel about daily events that are occurring with them and how he's dealing with their sinfulness and how he's dealing with their brokenness and how he has a, an, an answer for that brokenness. And at the same time, prophetically, God is speaking to us and the condition that we face and, and the hardships that we face. And God is pointing to a time because we know from God's word that Jesus wins the day. And so even in the Old Testament, we see this wonderful message that Jesus is the answer, that he wins the day. Come in your Bibles with me to chapter 9, verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought her into contempt, the land of Zebulun and the land of Natali. But in the latter time, he has made a glorious, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And so here Isaiah is broadcasting that the nation of Israel, and particularly the northern kingdom, had been suffering terribly. Assyria had been oppressing them. Many had been taken into captivity. And it was a terrible, gloomy time. Their armies had been defeated. And there seemed to be no hope on the horizon. We move forward thousands of years into our time, and does not sin do the same thing? Sin robs us, sin kills us, sin assails us. 
Sin takes away our hope. Sin leads us into gloominess. And we have the record and the reality that we live in a broken world. But then he says something amazing. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of nations. To the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. There's some good news coming, great news, that God is doing something wonderful. I want to take you to a slide just to show you a little bit of the geography of the land of the, particularly of the northern kingdom at this time and the two regions that he's speaking about here. The overall region of Galilee as he's talking about the northern part of Israel. But then when he talks about Zebulun, he's talking about the southern part of Galilee. And when he talks about Naphtali, he's talking really a little bit more about the eastern side of Galilee, a very rich and fertile time. And when he talks about the way of the sea, he's really talking about a trade route that comes down the side of the Sea of Galilee and talking about the wealth of the land and the blessing that comes from the wealth of that land and how invaders, when they came into the nation of Israel from the northern side particularly, they would go down that route and they would take their crops and their wealth and oppress them terribly. But God has and is doing something amazing in this passage. He's forecasting that he's going to shine his light upon them. This is really interesting because Matthew picks up this a little bit later on in the New Testament. Here's this nation suffering terribly. God's nation, the nation of Israel, and particularly the northern kingdom, suffered terribly. And where does God then begin his ministry of mercy, Where does he first shine the light of his grace? Where do you think he's going to do that the first time? Have a look, and the slide will be on there for you. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to, into Galilee. This is speaking of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of, well, there it is again, Zebulun and Naphtali, so that it would be spoken, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, that Jesus' ministry of grace, Jesus' ministry of redemption, Jesus' ministry to the whole world began in that place that first most suffered. And suffered not because of their goodness, but suffered because of their wickedness, and yet God even shows grace in that situation. They were suffering terribly because of their own sin. There are some metaphors here that I want to touch on before we get into the passage that I want to speak to you about. The first of those metaphors is darkness and light. Have a look in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. I think this is really a beautiful, beautiful image, beautiful metaphor, and personally to us a beautiful metaphor. Who has not ever walked in darkness? Who has not ever felt that stain and that agony upon your heart that things are just not going well? And no matter how hard you try and no matter how hard you discipline yourself, it seems to be one door of darkness after another and it's just hard to get yourself out of it. And I want to tell you that God is with you and that God's light is able to shine on you in that situation. And there is no situation that this world can take you to. There is no sin that Satan can tempt you with. There is no hole so deep that God cannot shine the light of his glorious grace upon you as he did upon the nation of Israel. They were so broken, so disappointed, so overwhelmed with their situation, they could not even begin to think that there would be light at the end of the tunnel. But then God does this, you see. I want you to see that this is not something they did, but this was something God did to them and for them as he does to and for us. Darkness simply means the oppression of the invaders. For the nation of Israel, when they thought about darkness, it was the swarms of conquering armies that swept down from the north, took their crops, took their families, took their young men into captivity. And yet, is that not true of us today? Has not the original sin from the Garden of Eden, as Adam and Eve, our forefather and mother, sinned against God, and the penalty of that sin was death, spiritual death upon all of humanity? And doesn't that spiritual death 
of humanity impact our lives so heavily today. That we are predisposed towards disobeying God. That we are predisposed towards trying to find joy and life and fulfillment in any other place but the living God. That we are predisposed to put ourselves before God and to worship us. We are idolatrous. We wake up and we think about idolatry. We go to sleep in idolatry. And yet God's mercy is upon us all the time. The filthy, filthy, filthy stain. Oh God, will you ever rescue us from the stain of sin? He will. This is what the beautiful light's all about. He says that there is a light that's shining. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They were not the great light. They didn't make the great light happen. This great light shone upon them. This is a work of God and God alone. They were in deep darkness. And then they saw a great light. And clearly this metaphor of light is a, for them is a, a liberation from the oppressing armies. God, please rescue us from the oppression we feel. But the metaphor is so rich when we bring it into our time and we apply it to the battle with abiding sin and the curse of sin and, and the curse of death in our lives is that Christ wins the day. Jesus Christ has died upon the cross and on the third day he rose again and he defeated sin and he has defeated death and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he has brought us into the family of God. He, we are the children of God because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And therefore, sin will not have its reign on us anymore. And death will not be our end, but rather eternal life. And this is not a light that we have shone on ourselves. This is not something we have done for ourselves. This is something that God did for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful, wonderful truths. How could this be in the Old Testament? I thought the Old Testament was just about law and just about this nation of Israel. No, it's the story of God who is eternal, beautiful, and a lover of you, very deeply in love with you. Have a look in your Bibles. Just come with me if you can, if you've got your Bible. I didn't put this up on the screen. This was just a tidbit for those of you that bring your Bibles, just to encourage you, okay? You can go out and say, you should have bought your Bible. Because <laughs> that thing you said was really awesome. Don't forget that last part, okay? <laughs> Verse 3. You have multiplied the nations, you have increased its joy. I find this amazing. The book of Isaiah, which deals with such heavy things as the nation of Israel being in captivity and the brokenness of sin in their lives, and yet one of the abiding themes that runs right through the book of Isaiah is the theme of joy. Yes. And the reason that there can be a theme of joy is because our God is victorious. Our God is not burdened by the things that we are burdened by. Our God is a rescuer and a redeemer, and in the darkest times, he brings joy. The first part you see there is you have multiplied the nations. It is God who has done this. The you is God. You ought to rejoice over this because this is the same you that's doing and working in our lives today. If it was left up to us to redeem ourselves, if it was left up to us to get ourselves out of the pit, we are the most pitiful of all because we do not have the strength. You have increased its joy. Come down to verse 4. You have broken as one day of the Midians. Broken as on the day of the Midian. I think this is um, a, ref a reference. God is referencing back to how he continued to provide blessing to the nation, how he continued to rescue them despite their failure, and how even when they were at the weakest point, God came through for them. Our God is the one that does the work. That's what I wanted you to get. The you is God. He's the one who will rescue. He is the one who will bless. So today we have some powerful people in our world. We come to this point where the nation of Israel is really suffering terribly and yet somehow or other God begins to say that I will break the burden, I will bear the responsibility, I will break the spear, I will bring a great light. The nation of Israel, I'd imagine, would have liked a great army. I think about Boris, what a winner of a name. Whoever, whichever country came up with the name Boris deserves a tick. That is just, it's Russia, is it? So what a blunt name, Boris. That must have been a very difficult birth. Let's name him Boris. 
And then we've got the other fella on the other side of the country with that wicked hairdo. I mean, his hairstylist is a magician. To be able to get that thing that Trumpy does on his head is just incredible. And those men have incredible responsibility in our world, leading, as it were, they say of Donald Trump, leading the free world, hoping that they can change the course of humanity, hoping that they can meet the needs of not only their own nation but of the entire world, hoping that they can lead us into a, a new era, era of prosperity. They're, they're big dreams, aren't they? And all jokes aside, I wish them well, but they are never, ever going to even get close. Not even close. The only power that they have has been given to them by the mighty God. And that power has been measured for a season. They do not have the answer to sin. They do not have the answer to death. They do not have the answer to the things that, are, that afflict us through this life. And I'll tell you right now, no one has those answers. No one in this world has the power to make us all at peace, full of joy, seriously content, and forgiven of our sins and right before our Creator. We are just muddling around the edges, pretending that we have the answers for life. We are keeping ourselves busy, hoping that no one notices that actually we're in deep, deep trouble and we need a light from outside this world to shine in and rescue us from our problems. This is what was happening with the nation of Israel. They were in deep trouble. They had no way forward. They had no answers. Every way they turned was blocked. They were in serious, serious trouble with no one to rescue them. But God. But God. And God's answer, I reckon, would have been tanks and those wicked helicopters the Americans have. No, God's answer is in verse 6. Just get, I say that because I want you to see how astounding God's answer is to the universal problem of death and sin, to the universal problem of the brokenness that we suffer as a world. It's not the UN. It's not some major political power who can economically take over our world and have every one of us saying and believing the same thing so that we find contentment. Have a look in verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now the import of this again is that it's not a child that we have raised up. It's not a child of our own making. It's a child and a son that has been given to us. It's like the light shining in. The light is not from us. The light is from God. And this child is not from us. This child is from God. And this son that we have to answer this problem is not from us. This son is from God. This is a miracle. And this is no ordinary son, as you would expect. This is no ordinary light. This is no ordinary grace. This is grace and light and mercy. This is a son. This is a child of the living God. And have a look what it says of this child. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He shall rule. And his rule will be divine. He will rule with a rod of iron. And his rule will be marked by peace and grace and strength and holiness and purity It'd be beautiful to be ruled over by him because he's altogether wonderful and powerful. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, as you've heard so beautifully last week. He is actually the fountain of all wisdom. He is the one with all the answers. He is the answer. He doesn't find the answers in a book and then bring them over and tell us about it. He is the fountain of wisdom. All wisdom is found in him because he created the heavens and the earth and all that we know. This child is miraculous. What an incredible answer. He is, as we will touch on a little bit more, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. That God has given us this answer. Don't you find that quite stunning? It, seriously, if we got put in a room and we were given the scenario of the nation of Israel and said, okay, you've got to come up with an answer, most of us would have come up with a bigger army. Most of us would have come up with a back door so that the nation of Israel could run away. But God says, actually, the answer is a child. This tiny infant that we will worship over the next few days, a tiny child that is so tender and so gentle, 
so incapable of caring for itself, still, nest, still nursing on its mother's breast, needing to be washed and clean and cared for. But God, in this great miracle, has given us a son and has given us a child, and this child is, in fact, God himself in fleshly form, both God, holy God, and holy man. And he is the answer, according to God, to all of our problems. That's amazing. Don't you agree? Amen. It's amazing. He is the answer. I thought the way Susie led this morning, uh, and again reminding us that God is the one who will meet our need. Man, don't we forget that? I was sitting there thinking, I was, like I've preached this already, and I should know this, but I was sitting there thinking, God, I'm so sorry. I just... I forget that you're the font of wisdom. I forget that you're the mighty God. I forget that you're actually the answer that I need. It's not a thing. It's not a new system. It's not a new plan. It's a person, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is, as it says here, the mighty God. I want you to come with me, and it'll be on the slide for you. John chapter 1 and verse 3. John puts it this way so beautifully. When you think about mighty works of God the Father... I, my mind immediately goes to the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's, is that not a mighty work of God to create all that we see? I've, I'm hoping that when we get our new bodies, and this is just a sideline thing, um, that we're going to be able to see the universe as God's made it, be able to move through it quickly, you know, like they do in those movies. I, just, I think that would just rock to be able to go from one constellation to the next. And uh, God is the one who created all these things the mighty work of God. And yet John says in John chapter 1, verse 3, this is about the baby in Isaiah 9, verse 6, the child that was given to us, the child that was born. He says, all things were made through him, and without him was nothing, not anything made that was made. And so John very quickly realizes that, of course, if this child is as Isaiah says, is the mighty God, it's natural for the mighty God to do mighty works. And he reveals to us that Jesus Christ, prior to his birth, was involved in the creation of the world and you and I. He is the mighty God. He is the mighty answer of God to the things that ail this world. Hallelujah, we know Jesus Christ is Savior. Colossians and Paul reveals it this way. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. I love this last bit, and for him. You were not made for yourselves. You were not made to play video games and lay around like a couch potato. You were made for God to bring glory to him. That was just for my sons. I thought I'd roll that one out. Okay. You were made. Oh, I think you should thrill about that. Man, I, like, you could have been made to just do nothing. You could have just been made to float around the water. But you were actually made for the creator of the heavens and the earth. Wow, you are so significant. You were made by him. And the one who made you, according to the New Testament, is the one that's spoken about in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It is the child, the mighty God. Jesus Christ. Jesus, the mighty God. And we can see this. You would expect if Jesus was the mighty God, and he is, and I'm not going to try and prove that to you. Isaiah doesn't prove that to you. He just says, he's the mighty God. Live with it. It's real. God created the heavens and the earth. Live with it. It happened. And then as you look at the life of Jesus, you would expect to see him as mighty God. I reflect upon for a moment, without going into great detail, about Muhammad, who saw himself as a prophet of the Most High. And he was not confused, and he lived the life of a prophet. It was just the life of a man living on earth and devoted, but living on earth. Jesus was never confused about himself in this way. Jesus understood that he was God in the flesh, naturally, and it showed by his works. Just come with me for a moment and let your mind run through the New Testament. Let your mind run through the life of Christ. Let your mind run over the things that Jesus did when he walked on the earth. God in the flesh, holy God, holy man, walking amongst humanity. It's like a, a giant tiptoeing through the tulips, and not one of them was broken, not one of them was crushed. 
We see the Lord Jesus Christ's power over nature in Luke chapter 5. We see his power over disease in Matthew chapter 9. We see his power over demons in Luke chapter 8. We see his power over death. He's, he, he was raised from the dead on the third day by the power of God. You remember when he called out to Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus was raised from the dead. Do you remember the leper whom he touched and healed? The blind man, and he made mud and spat in his eyes, and the man received his sight back. The lame man that was lowered through the roof, and Jesus spoke to him, and he was forgiven of his sins. The mighty God, walking through our history, revealing his power and his authority over all that he has created. Jesus, the mighty, mighty God. Perhaps no such a mighty thing as him raising from the dead. And Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. And he says, I was declared, or rather, I beg you, but let me start again. And was declared, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Seen any resurrections lately? Anybody in your family been raised up? No. And Jesus, our Savior, was hung upon the cross in front of thousands and speared and spat upon and mocked and died an agonizing death. Was taken down off the cross and placed in a tomb. He was bound up and they anointed his body and they left him there because he was dead. And then on the third day, a miracle according to the power of God, Jesus, God in the flesh, the mighty God, raised himself up and was witnessed by thousands. And others were raised out of the grave. The same Jesus that through the Holy Spirit dwells in us today. The same Jesus, the mighty God that's spoken about in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. The same Jesus that is the answer to the penalty of sin, to the curse of death. He is the answer to all of life's issues. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's altogether powerful and wonderful. He is just majestic. He is risen from the dead and seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and nothing is too difficult for him. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing is impossible with our God. Isn't that great news? Amen. Hallelujah. And he is our God. And not that we have made him our God. He has made us his children. If we believe upon him, he's given us the right to be the children of God. If we believe upon him, he's given us the right to be the children of God. And he says he will indwell us with his spirit and put his seal upon us for the day of redemption. Hallelujah. We have the spirit of God, the nature of God dwelling in us. We belong to him, the mighty God. Man, that's, you want to know somebody important? How about being a child of the mighty God? Hallelujah. Is there anything too difficult for the children of God? And thank you, Lord Jesus that we can pray to you right now as you are seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. We worship you. He's our advocate. You know what an advocate means? An advocate means that somebody that stands in between and advocates for you. He's able to put his hand on humanity because he's holy man. But not only is he holy man, he's holy God. He can put his other hand on the living God himself. And he becomes our mediator. He's the mighty God. He's our God. He calls us friends. Can you believe it? What? He is so great and so merciful. So what does that mean for us? I've nearly, I've taken you too long, but can I say three more things that shouldn't take me longer than 30 minutes? <laughs> you guys, are so, like I've got you trapped, haven't I? I've asked the stewards to lock the doors. You can't get out. Okay. Anybody tries to get up, they'll be tasered. I'd love to see that happen. So, <laughs> just quickly, I want to say three things to you. He's the source of our power. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, For in him the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And now he is indwelling us through the Holy Spirit. God the divine in all his fullness in us. And he is the power for our lives. He is the source of our strength. As Acts was read to you earlier today, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
Who here has had the Holy Spirit come upon them when they believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ according to the word of God and confessed him as Lord and Savior and you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit? I tell you, according to God's word, that the Holy Spirit, the power of God dwells in you. Hallelujah. And he has given you the power, his power, so that you can be witnesses of him in this world and throughout this world. In your homes, in your streets, in your suburbs, in your city, in this nation, throughout the world. That's the first thing. He is the strength of our lives. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen? Amen. This is not because don't, you don't have to get all bunched up like a square or rod in a motorbike and like grit your teeth and think, you know, God's going to bless me, God's going to bless me, I can make this happen. No, you've got the fullness of God dwelling in you. You need just simply to abide in him. And as you abide in him, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Because it is God doing it in you, not you. It is God working through you, not you working through God. It is God who is doing the work. And thirdly, and as we come to a close, he secures, I love this, he secures my eternity. He secures my eternity. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last days. Amen? By God's strength and power, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this mighty God, Jesus, is guarding me, guarding me and protecting me and keeping me for the home that he has prepared for me in heaven. So don't make the mistake of getting caught up in the Christmas scene this year and thinking, what a cute little mild meek baby. Yes, beautiful and I love little ones as much as anyone else but I fear and tremble before this one because he's not just a baby he's the mighty God and he's my mighty God and I revere him he is the one who has the keys to life and death he is the one who died on my behalf so that my vile sins could be forgiven he is the one who has secured eternity for me and for you he is the mighty God. Let's stand together and worship in prayer. Excuse me. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we say thank you, mighty God, for saving us. Thank you for shining your light into our lives and we ask you to shine it into our nation. We need you so much. And just like the former nations before us, we are broken and we feel as though we can fix ourselves. We are deluded in thinking that we can heal ourselves, that we can bring ourselves joy and peace and that we can overcome death through science. We repent of our wickedness and we acknowledge that you are the mighty God who created us. You created the heavens and the earth and you are the one we come to and we plead our case before. We need you and we invite you afresh into our lives. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins and that you would heal our land. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins and that you would come into our lives and be both our Lord and our Saviour. We pray and thank you so much for your mercy toward us. Oh Lord Jesus, we honour and worship you. And as we enter into Christmas, Lord Jesus, and we hear the stories about the baby, we will think about you and Isaiah 9, 6 as the mighty God. When we look upon the nativity scenes and we see the baby in the manger, our minds, O oh God, will go towards you, the mighty God. And we say thank you for your great grace to us. What a, a wonderful season. Again, we bring before you our loved ones that don't know you, and we bring them with all of our heart and ask that you would save them. We thank you that you've already had mercy upon them. You've shown them great grace. And Father, we plead with you in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ that during this season you would save them. We ask your blessing on Graham tonight as he opens your word to many, many hundreds, indeed thousands that don't know you. And pray that you would use your word to reveal to them your great love and mercy. We say thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen.